So hello everyone, uh, I am Wes Purvis, I'm product manager at MIST, and I'm going to talk about Wi-Fi things during Mobility Field Day, which I say every year. So let's uh, let's just kind of go through where are we with, with MIST Wi-Fi. Um, we're in the midst of our Wi-Fi 6E you know, generation, and for us, uh, Wi-Fi 6E has been uh, hugely successful. It's it's actually AP45 is our is our top selling AP, um, and it's not it's not really even close. Um, you know, comparing back to Wi-Fi 6 generation, um, I, I think probably there's some you know it, it's pretty it's it's easy for customers to adopt a new generation with MIST. You don't have to upgrade um, you know controller code, or you can just deploy a new AP with keeping your your same APs you know uh, as they are. So pretty much we see net new customers um, almost exclusively choosing six gig uh, capable APs. Uh, and and I would say about half are turning on six gig, um, maybe half to two thirds right now. Um, so some some choose to uh, roll out uh, a, a six gig capable AP with, without uh, six gig. And existing customers are beginning their migration. It takes, you know, and this is kind of coming up in, uh, uh, as as their refreshes come up, um, and opportunistically, where they know they have capacity issues today, uh, and think six gig uh, can help. Uh, we're we're looking at Wi-Fi seven. Wi-Fi seven is is on the horizon for us. Um, but you know what what I tell what I tell our customers is six gig. The six gigahertz band is the biggest and most important thing in Wi-Fi in the past decade, and probably will be for the next decade as well. Right. If you, th you you know if you think about 11 AC, 11 you, you know even 11 N, 11 AX, the the biggest leap forward is the six gigahertz band with the additional capacity uh, potential that it brings. So let's go through just you know if you don't know we we today we have two uh, six gig uh, AP models the AP 45 AP 34 the 45 is our flagship uh, AP model. It, that's the dual five gig. It's four by four. Um, you, you know, we even it, it has our virtual BLE array. It has even like an accelerometer, or you know, we've has added this because we found it helpful with location. Knowing the orientation of the AP is it is it facing down? Is it on a wall? Is it facing up? Um, just that simple actually helps our location engine uh, with you know with with more accurate uh, location. It actually helps with our auto placement, which I'll which I'm going to talk a little bit about as well. And today um, we have announced uh, the AP24. So this is um, uh, completes our our indoor portfolio of, of Wi-Fi 6E APs. Uh, so I happen to have one with me, and uh, so it is our it is the smallest AP we've ever made uh, outside of our wall plate form factor. But um, it's it's the smallest AP we've made, and uh, you know it uses our same bracket, and you know it's, it's just about. Uh, you know, as small as we can make it without, uh, you know, changing our bracket. So uh, we think that this will be a really nice uh, form factor and really nice AP for, um, you know, for, for cost conscious customers, customers who uh, may not care. Actually, yeah. okay. um, so the, the, the AP is, is tri-band capable, but dual band concurrent. So it, it, that adds a interesting deployment mode where uh, it allows us to achieve a, a, a lower price point. Um, but there are many customers who may not be ready for six gig, or they may not need ubiquitous you know, 2.4 coverage anymore. And so this gives you the flexibility of having a, a dedicated five gig radio and a, a, a switchable radio that can either be in 2.4 mode or six gig mode. And RRM will switch back and forth um, you know, based, based on conditions. But there's a huge frequency difference between 2.4 and 6 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. How do you solve that problem antenna-wise? Uh, separate antennas. Yeah, so it's separate RF paths, right? So there's a little switch and switch between the paths. Okay. Do you have a separate antenna for each 2.4, 5, and 6? Or 5 and 6 sharing the same? Uh, separate antennas for 5 and 6 as well. Okay, and I'll just I'll just add uh, this is our most eco-friendly AP as well. Um, the packaging, a first for us, is uh, made from 100% recyclable materials. So this this is our our plan going forward in, in new AP models. But um, you know, if, if you buy a missed AP today, it comes wrapped in a in a plastic bag. Uh, the bracket is is uh, wrapped in plastic. There's some uh, screws and hardware. 
that's also in plastic. So, I mean, this this is actually you know, this is the production packaging. Um, you know, we have a little this this slide. This goes between the AP and the uh, and the bracket. The bracket, you know, comes with no packaging, and our screw uh, bag is now a, a cardboard bag. So, uh, we're we're proud of this, and and this will kind of this will be you know for new AP APs going forward. This this is um, you know how we plan to do our packaging. And multi pack options. Uh, or ten packs. Uh, no, no multi packs uh, at this time, um, but uh, the, uh, the 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 eco friendly packaging is there. Does the cardboard insert nest together? We'll just have ten of them, <laughs> and ten of those cardboard inserts sit on top of each other, or are they separate? Um, you mean you mean this? Yes. Uh, yeah, they could stack on each other. Okay, yep. that, that's a big one when unpacking like a yep. hundred of them and then having to fill up yep. a dumpster. Okay, and just uh, this was a apparently a controversial slide, uh, but this is uh, you know just to kind of show AP24 in comparison to our AP portfolio is our smallest. It's about seven inches by seven inches, um, but if you're curious, here it is. If I could just add one thing, right? I, I think um, I, I don't want uh, a, a point to be lost. One of the reasons our customers are able to migrate to Wi-Fi 6E fast is you know whether it's a large co-located campus architecture or a distributed enterprise architecture, we don't have this notion of, I got to upgrade my controllers, I got to upgrade my controller image, right? Like we could have our very first AP, AP41, next to an AP43, next to an AP45, next to an AP24, all in my network with no bearing on what the cloud is running, right? Just a fundamentally different approach to this so that, you know, that's why we're seeing just customers seamlessly migrate not have to worry about you know the boat anchors that I have to carry with me in my journey, right? So, so speaking of that, do you see customers doing like maybe like a salt and pepper approach where like they have an AP forty three deployment that they're pretty happy with and they don't want to rip and replace all of them, but they're doing like oh I'm going to sprinkle in some AP forty fives now to give us some six gigahertz. So uh, I would not suggest doing a, I'm going to put an a, uh, AP43 here, AP45 there, but in, in specific areas. So like a, let's say you have a, like a town hall meeting area that you, that you want, you know, that's going to be a, you know, capacity issue, capacity issue area. So you, just in that area, you could put six gig capable APs and then, you know, the surrounding areas, you keep your, your Wi-Fi six APs. Okay. So that, that is happening um, or on like a, you know, building level, kind of thing or floor level as well. That's what we see. So coming back to the antenna question, um, what is the multi-use of MIMO capabilities of the 24? Uh, the AP24 as a two by two AP okay. could uh, could do multi-user MIMO to two one by one stations. Okay, two by two in each of the frequency band. Yes, that's okay, correct. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, so uh, what we're not announcing is an outdoor AP. Uh, so let's talk about uh, outdoor and six gigahertz. So as you are probably aware, there are rules around outdoor usage of six gigahertz in much of the world. Um, in, in the US and the Americas and that have adopted 1200 megahertz, um, there is no outdoor uh, at all yet. In, in Europe and the UK, you can actually use outdoor, but it's restricted to a like a SRD short range device type power level, which uh, is 25 milliwatts. It's similar to like the Uni3 power in five gig, um, but it so it's it's a low low transmit power, um, even lower than like low power indoor mode of of six gig. So you know in in the U.S. there will be this standard power mode, and there's there's been a lot of discussions around it and and some delays, right? So the FCC has taken a little bit of time in in terms of granting approvals of of the AFC systems. So there are now 12 or 13, I forget the exact numbers, provisionally approved AFC providers um, who are going through their testing. And um, we're expecting to see actual cu um, customer, uh, customer tests over the summer of, of AFC and potentially um, you know, with, with potential um, uh, approval, device approval, AP approvals um, coming uh, in as early as, as Q4. So that's kind of where we've, Think we are from a from a uh, standard power AFC perspective, but that's all subject to change and kind of at the mercy of the FCC. One thing I want to point out is 
Uh, many people are probably aware of the geolocation requirements so of, of AFC. So an AP has to report its location and a confidence score, you know, a confidence uh, value of how confident am I that I am in, you know, 95% I'm in this, this area. But the AP or device also must report um, its geolocation. So that, that geolocation is, is good for as long as the AP doesn't reboot. If the AP loses power, it must again like the, the geolocation credentials or uh, coordinates that it provides are no longer valid. So it has to have a fresh set of geolocation so, um, or prove that it didn't move. So it, it, um, you know, as, we're, as we're designing uh, our AP, so our, our indoor portfolio doesn't have a GPS receiver. Um, outdoor will. So indoor, if we want to do standard power, which we're thinking about what are the use cases. Um, so one use case is external antennas, uh, uh, which, is, which is an obvious one. And beyond that, we're not so sure of, you know, if, if there are actually, you know, real use cases for indoor standard power APs. Um, I'd be curious, you know, uh, you know, if people start a discussion on who have deployed six gig, do you feel that the low power indoor transit power is, is adequate for your, for your needs? <laughs> Troy shaking his head no. Well, don't, don't we miss out on the whole directional antennas? Well, so antennas, so, uh, external antennas, Aside, right? If if a a normal indoor AP six you know deployed in six gig with low power mode, is that enough transfer power for you? If you're just looking at transfer power, it's enough. But the advantage six gigahertz brings me is to provide extra capacity performance yep. to my customers, which I initially want in those high density environments yep. where I want to use directional antennas. Sure, sure. So to me, directional antennas is a huge. Correct. I, I, agreed. Mm. Agreed. I'm I'm saying simply in a like the AP24. What I want to do standard power on AP24. What does that actually get me? And so for but yes for external antennas absolutely. So that actually before I go on. So let me just talk about what we're planning from a from an AFC perspective. Um, it's going back. But so there's two modes of operation in AFC. You can be a um, you know AP can talk directly to the provider, or there can be a proxy in the middle. Um, being that all of our APs are cloud managed, the MIST cloud will act as a proxy for our for for our MIST APs talking to the AFC operator. Will that allow for redundancy on the AFC side? So will you, will the cloud talk to multiple AFC providers? Um, potentially, like that's something we've thought about. Is do we actually care about that? Well, I guess it depends on the operating mode, right? Does does it if it loses communications to AFC, like for example, in CBRS side, if we lose communications to the SAS, radio shut down. Yes. Does that happen on yeah, after so, hour? Uh, an AP must check in uh, every 24 hours. If it doesn't check in in that 24 hour period, 24 hour later, it shuts off. So it's 24 hours, not, I think on CBRS side, it's like two minutes. So it's very, very short. Yep. So you have a bigger window, but if it loses communication to AFC and it yep. shuts the radios down, that would be a. So, so we're, we're, we're building a, a modular, like a you know, platform independent uh, implementation. And the AFC uh, interface is standards-based anyway. Um, so we'll be able to interface with multiple. And we're going to start with one. And if, if we need, if we end up needing multiple, we'll, we'll go down that. So just your kind of differences between low power, standard power. So uh, in the US, you have 1,200 megahertz using all, the, all four uni uh, bands and six gig, um, where in, in the uh, in standard power mode, you have about 850 megahertz using uni 5, uni 7. It requires using the AFC, it allows you to have outdoor APs and weatherized APs and external antennas. Uh, so those are some of the benefits of standard power mode. In low power mode, in the US, you actually, um, you're allowed to have antennas, you know, directional antennas, but they must be integrated into the AP. Um, and this was actually a little bit of a rule change from the F FCC. Um, so you, you may know we have an AP45E, which in the US we're capable of sending, selling today with six gig disabled. Um, there was a rule change there. We thought we would be able to sell with, um, uh, you know, plugging in, plugging in your own antennas. We're able to do that worldwide. So actually everywhere except for the US, <laughs> even in Canada and Americas, we're, we're able to sell the AP45E um, with six gig enabled, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's a transit power uh, advantage as well with, um, with standard power. And uh, clients can use higher power as well, which would be one potential benefit. Um, now, one risk is this client connectivity requirement. As a client, uh, whatever I am certified as, so if I'm an indoor client, 
I can only connect to a low power indoor AP. If I'm a, I can, I can be a dual client, so I can, if I'm certified as dual, I can talk to both. But the problem is not many people have certified as dual today. Uh, so some will go back and do it, I'm sure, but many will not. So your, you know, your, your Android phone from two years ago probably is not going to go back and recertify um, as a dual client. So, you know, they would have to fall back to five gig. In that case, they wouldn't be able to talk to a standard power six gig AP. Unless, so there's an industry effort underway to kind of change the rule to just classify as like a mobile client um, to make this not really an important thing. But um, today that's that's not the case. So you have to follow these, you know, indoor versus standard power dual type of client. Okay, so now let me move on to, you know, some, maybe some more exciting things. <laughs> so uh, RRM, missed, uh, you know, missed RRM we feel is, um, uh, extremely robust and powerful, and uh, uh, you know, I would put out there as the best RRM in, in the industry. Um, we've, you know, just in the past couple months, we've done some extremely challenging environments. We uh, we did a um, 80,000 80, uh, attendee conference, which was tip, uh, previously static channels. Um, they would do spend months on static channels. Uh, they did 100% missed RRM and super happy. You know, we walked around trying to find problem areas and, and couldn't. Um, you know, in, in higher ed and, um, you, you know, which can be, yes, engineers can be very particular on their on their designs, um, are, are using RRM. So we feel very good. Um, and we're kind of optimizing, you know, we have this reinforcement model where we look at our SLEs, we determine if there's a problem, we're optimizing for the user experience, and then we take an action on it. So we make some sort of change based on, based on the data that we have. Um, and then the reward comes back in, we look at, was that a good change or bad change? So this has served us very well, um, but it, it as we have you know seen additional capabilities on the access points like dual five gigahertz um, uh, or or you know other features where it, there's more complexity here, and, and we feel that we need to make an enhancement um, in terms of looking um, at the operating capabilities of the access points more holistically. So as an example, if um, if I'm having, you know, a poor user experience due to capacity, right? This, this can come in a couple different flavors. It's, do I have enough APs? So here's an actual example um, of a, uh, I, I believe this was an, an auditorium. Class comes in and there's so, you know, so many clients are coming on. We actually classify it as insufficient capacity due to uh, client count. Um, and there's just simply not enough APs in this environment. Um, you know, this is 20 megahertz channel width, you know, it, it, it's a good design. They just need um, a couple additional APs. Whereas the second example is there's capacity issues and we're classifying it as Wi-Fi interference. And the APs are, are configured as 40 megahertz on five gig. The issue here is there's too many APs and not enough available channels because of 40 megahertz channel bandwidth. So the more appropriate configuration would be 20 megahertz. And today we don't do the, you know, uh, an auto bandwidth selection and we've resisted it, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what, what our plans are there. So when, you know, as we go through this, you know, we're trying to balance you know, our, how, we're, how we're configuring our, our Wi-Fi networks. So the balance is you wanna maximize your, your, net, your network performance by you know, minimizing bad design and, and you know, poor user experience. And there's a couple of different levers that you can pull to do that. Um, you know, from from an RRM perspective, of course, we have to operate in you know, in constraints of the design. Um, but you know, we we have some band flexibility. We can do wider channels, narrower channels. Um, we can turn off radios. We can you know lower transit power, and those all have trade offs. So where we're headed with this is learning. Um, uh, you know, is making these more holistic optimizations based on learning the behavior in the site. So here's a couple of different. You know examples that we've looked at of, okay, I'm, I want to know what is the five gigahertz usage like? What is the two point four usage like? Are there a lot of clients? Is this a high roaming site? Um, do clients tend to dwell high usage, low usage? And you know, here's just different, a couple different environments. You know, so you know, robotics warehousing, dormitories, um, you know, enterprise retail, just just different examples of the usage patterns that we see. And so RRM actually looks at these metrics, um, and to make um, to make decisions now, in addition to our um, 
you know, uh, as part of, you know, the reinforcement learning that we do. But where this is, where this helpful is helpful is now we can decide, are we going to optimize? What are we going to optimize for? So if I have a lot of 2.4 clients, I probably don't want to turn off my 2.4 radios as much, right? Because I need that 2.4. I need to make sure I'm, I'm prioritizing 2.4. Or I don't have any 2.4, so I can turn all those radios off or, you know, a, a decent chunk of them. I don't really care. Um, or roaming or capacity um, and channel bandwidth. So this is particularly relevant because, you know, our default channel bandwidth is 40 megahertz. And, you know, the old you know, the saying is, you know, do the widest channels until you can. Um, so that works a lot well in a lot of environments. Some environments it doesn't work well. Um, and so, you know, part of this uh, improvement will be a, a, you know, auto channel bandwidth. And we, one approach that we've seen fail is kind of this AP level type of approach where I'm making decisions on the AP level. And, you know, with channel width in particular, clients tend to prefer wider channels, so they'll stick. Um, so we'll, we'll take a, a more holistic approach of kind of a site level um, or at least in a contiguous RF area of, um, of channel width. Um, and so this is particularly relevant in like in the EU or UK where, um, you know, there's only 500 megahertz of six gig spectrum. So being able to decide between, um, you know, 40s, 20s, 40s and 80s um, in, in, you know, where you don't have as, you don't have the full 1200 megahertz of spectrum um, like you do in the US. So I think this is, it's, it's really cool. So if, like here's here's some of like the the decisions that have a direct impact on each other. So if I want to lower my transfer power, I can do that. Or is it better to actually disable my radio? Uh, if I disable my radio, should I actually convert that into a different band? Like should I do dual five gig? Okay, if I do dual five, should I've actually done water channels instead? Right? So these all have an impact on each other. And this is you know we're calling this you know using this behavior. Uh, monitoring to kind of break the symbiotic relationships we have um, in Wi-Fi. Um, so we think this is going to be really, really cool. This is kind of the biggest change since we introduced our AI-driven RRM, um, you know, over the past couple of years. So this is, uh, you know, this is a big one for us. If I can add a fine point to this, um, our AI-driven RRM today, just game-changing in the sense that literally we tell people, you could bring your CCIEs and, and set up your Cisco networks or on a Ruben network, you know, have at it, configure it to the very best with MIST, deploy, and step away from the keyboard. We, you know, you know, an 80,000, you know, attendee event completely with RRM, robotic facilities with RRM, higher ed with RRM, you know, lots of people have challenged us around that, but, but ultimately we, it's done really, really well. So we're very proud of what we have today. I think this is a step function in terms of being able to bring more context and learning site behavior. Uh, super excited about it uh, and, you know, already started to uh, run pilots around uh, the possibilities here. So uh, this is a big deal for us. Can I, yeah. can I challenge you a little bit on this? Because <laughs> it sounds great, but, you know, when we look at Wi-Fi 6 and going forward, what's really important in terms of my utilization of my radio resources is how I schedule my resource units, you know, so FDMA is also how do I apply my antenna techniques with beamforming and things like that. That's really where I have the potential for a good performing network, high capacity network. So how does that fit? Because that's really, so there's, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so there's, there's a step before that, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Which is I need to have, I have tools in my network. I need to have my network set up so that I can use those you know what those Wi-Fi six uh, capabilities. So like I have my AP forty five. It can operate as a as a two four five and six AP, or I can have dual five. So I can have five gig, five gig, and six gig. Right. That that's the fundamental question. So should I? Which band should I be in? Should I do twenty megahertz versus forty megahertz? You have to answer those questions before you can get to your 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 Wi-Fi six capabilities. And that's that's what this is trying to solve for. Okay, I get it, but I'm still not quite convinced. Okay. <laughs> because, you know, the, the dream when we get there is this user in their RF environment will get this allocation of resources. Mm -hmm. And this user that's in a different RF environment will get a different resource. And if I've harmonized for the good of the whole, mm -hmm. right, then I've really lost the ability to then optimize my RF. Like, like okay, you're saying, 
maybe I have to be forced to a 20 megahertz band, but in fact, um, if I more effectively use my resource units and um, yeah, beamforming techniques, then the maybe I could operate there, yeah. it in a 40 megahertz band. Yeah, I, I right? get what you're saying. The industry, the technology is not there yet. Yeah, it's not there yet, but yep. okay. Fair enough. Wes, I see you have uh, disabled radios. Yep. I think today you only do 2.4. In future, you're going to be doing you know, disabled 5 gig or 2 pod or something. So, like so there's, there's, there's nothing technically stopping us from doing it today. It's a choice that, we've, that we haven't done it. Um, it's, it's something easy enough that we could. We just haven't seen a use case for it. So if there is a use case for it, we would, yeah, sure, why not? OK, so I just have a, a few minutes left. And um, I want to wrap up with uh, auto placement and auto orientation. So this is something that we talked about last year, and I just want to provide an update of, of where we are, um, because it's uh, we're actually testing this with customers now, and, and you know would be happy to have people uh, test it. So just as as a as a recap, um, so we have um, a capability to automatically place access points on a map and automatically orient them. Um, so the Auto placement uses 802.11mc uh, find time measurement. The auto orientation uses our, um, our virtual BLE uh, antenna array. And there's, there's basically um, you know, two use cases that I'll go through. Um, but you know, there's, there's some things in here where you know, we, we do these measurements. We, we leverage, just like with the VBLE, we have um, uh, machine learning to learn Path, you know the path loss of our of our devices. Um, uh, we're doing that as well for determining line of sight versus non line of sight, which is a really important. Uh, turns out to be really important in, in in this type of technology. So the two main use cases that we're that we're solving for are um, like an audit type use case where I already have APs on a map and I just want you to tell me are my APs where I think where I think they are. And then the second use case is I have a new deployment and I want APs on a map. Place them for me. Um, and so the things that we're trying to optimize are, you know, the placement and orientation of the uh, of the of the map or of the APs. Um, the scale of the map turns out to be really important. Um, so there's some things we can do to help with that. Um, and then, you know, we need to determine line of sight versus non line of sight because that's important for uh, the the accuracy of, of the solution. So just to kind of um, actually, let me let me flip over. So I have a, just a small demo site here, I, just to kind of show the concept. Um, so there's five APs on a um, on a map here, and uh, so I'm gonna move the zoom, the zoom bar. So I have my auto placement and or auto orientation buttons. So I can I'm actually just gonna hit start, and so what this will do is it'll put the APs into a FTM mode, and they'll actually run. Uh, FTM between these between these five APs, and so here's a little timer. Um, but this is this is what we're actually doing. We're building a a mesh of access points, uh, if you will. Um, this <laughs> switches up, <laughs> but it's a um, so if you think about if I have five APs, ten APs, a hundred APs on a floor plan, this can become you know quite complex, quite fast because we're we're actually running measurements between every pair of APs, every pair combination. So you can have Hundreds or thousands, um, tens of thousands of measurements happening here, um, and you, you know we we perform the measurements multiple times, and it, it allows um, you essentially we just we build out this mesh, um, and so this is what we see. This is kind of the back end view um, of a kind of a, a brownfield approach, where you know where I already have APs on a on a floor plan, um, but just to kind of go through some examples. So here is a um, you know some from from you know, this is from customer environments. So here's a, a floor plan where um, there's actually two misplaced APs. So maybe a little bit tough to tell, but if you look at um, the, most of the APs have gray lines, but two of them have colorful lines. One, uh, one is blue, one's mostly red. So blue in this case means that we are uh, under reporting. The APs are under reporting. So the, S, the location estimate is under, uh, where red means we're overestimating. And so, uh, okay, so we have those measurements. The system actually flags these two APs as problematic, and then we present that to the user that these two APs are problematic, and you should go look at those. Right, so that's the AP audit use case. It's as simple as that. Like, are the APs where you think they should be? Um, 
And we do some some extra things in here where you know we'll actually present a um, a you know a coverage area of you know where the the AP could potentially be. Um, here's a, another you know larger, more complex floor plan. This is actually a, a grocery store. Um, Seventy-five APs in this uh, in this store because there's a lot of APs. They have a lot of freezer APs and and uh, chillers. Um, and this presents its own set of challenges. So one thing that we've learned is um, APs can be isolated. <laughs> uh, where uh, and that's the whole point of showing this is uh, so how do we deal with with APs that are isolated that we're we're unable to locate? So part of our workflow is to first tell you we can't locate these APs. You should place those. Um, or if we're like we have like you know half a solution, we're, we'll ask you for more information. So one of the things that we've learned is there may be times where we need additional information. So let's just ask for it. Um, so that's that's part of part of the solution here. And you can actually see there's some ice, like these ones that don't have lines. These are all isolated APs um, in uh, in some freezers. So here's a here's an example um, uh, just of a, a, where two APs are actually misplaced. So these two APs were actually swapped. Um, the algorithm uh, uh, identified it. Now this UX will change slightly. Um, we're, today we're just swapping them on the map, but we'll actually like very obviously flag these as as misplaced APs. So there'll, there'll actually be some status in here that's that's not currently in the UI, um, but uh, but is coming very shortly. Um, What's for, what about for access points? I mean, that are I mean, that's the office environment. What about like uh, with the warehouse environment or more of like an industrial environment, something yep. like that? Um, will will this kind of apply to that also? Yep. And yeah. So okay. so actually, so uh, the challenge in a warehouse is typically it's external antennas, where um, a, the antennas are most likely pointed in a particular direction, oftentimes straight down. Mm -hmm. So that limits the number of APs that it can talk to. So um, we've done testing in in warehouse environments. Um, uh, and it, it works. Um, I'm just not. I'm just not showing the data. Is that is that something that I guess I can test with my customers currently? Like, if, okay. Yep. Uh, so here's here's the, I showed the that you know that floor plan where those two APs are swapped. Here's where it, here's actually what it looks like you know from our back end view. Um, and then uh, I just want to show. Okay, so here is okay. So this finished. Let me refresh. Um, I just want to show, you know, from from the algorithm, uh, from the live run, what I actually did. Um, so, this AP, this picked up a misplaced AP, right? It's actually this AP is actually in the middle um, of these of these four APs, and it and it identified that. Um, so that's you know, in a nutshell, what we're trying to do for the audit use case. Um, for the for the greenfield or new deployment use case, um, it's I don't have APs on a map. Uh, please place them. Um, so today uh, we'll ask you to actually associate the APs with the map. You don't place them, but you associate. Um, and then for this workflow, we at some point need reference anchors. Um, so you can either set them ahead of time, which is what we've done here, um, or, and probably the, the preferred method is, what we've found is it's hard to identify what are the most optimal anchor APs. So let us actually suggest them to you. So you can actually hit start. We'll run our measurements, and then we'll come back to you and suggest what would be the, the best uh, anchor APs. And then you can actually place those and, and recalculate. You don't need to rerun the FTM, but we'll just recalculate uh, the solution. So, so a lot of us who deploy environments like this are uploading our the design, you know, the mm -hmm. output from our design software, uh, yep. whichever that, whatever that may be. Do you guys consider that to be green? Like, if we no, have no. So that's that's what I showed in the first right. So that, dive. That's all brownfield. This yep. is literally yeah. You have you, nothing. You have APs on a map already because you're ingesting a design file. Right. Um. So that's the audit use case. Right. Okay. So this is just straight up. No, you may not even have a. You may you may not even know where they put them. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, okay. I'm well, four minutes over time, and I think Sudhir said I could have five. Quick question: <laughs> What would the accuracy be? So uh, what we're seeing from an accuracy perspective, um, our, our goal is two meters, um, and we often see you know in the in the one to two meter range. Um, so where the challenges come in is uh, today we rely on scale on the floor plan. So if the scale is incorrect, that's problematic. Um, there's some things that we think we can do to help there. Um, if in the uh, in the brownfield approach, um, 
you know, we, we rely on the AP placement and, and so, you know, we solve for that. Um, but then also line of sight versus non-line of sight uh, is, is a challenge as well. So when you're in a non-line of sight environment, I have more multipath. And, um, and that, can, that can affect the, the, the distance measurements. So we have to determine if we're line of sight versus non-line of sight. And we have some uh, machine learning uh, techniques to determine that. Um, and so all those things combined, every environment is different. And we're certainly looking to test this in, in more environments um, because it's really good learning for us. Um, and you know we're we're ready um, in in customer environments, but um, you, you know in in the environments that we've tested, and we typically see one to two meters. Um, but again, in the think about that's greenfield. In the brownfield, we just need to audit: are the APs you know is the AP close you know or where you think where you think it is on the map? So that the accuracy really only is important for the for the greenfield new deployment type approach. Uh, but let me just thirty seconds summarize. What the awesomeness you saw in the last hour and a half. Number one, uh, we are over a billion dollar business at AI driven enterprise, uh, the number three market shareholder in North America for wireless, fastest growing wireless business uh, in the world today. Uh, Marvis now uh, is able to ingest client data from Zoom calls. Marvis is able to connect with Chat GPT for summarization. Marvis is now a member of your team. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff connect with your, uh, you know, Juniper Mist uh, sellers um, and, and see if, if you want to get onto the, uh, the trials of this. And then, uh, you know, we've announced a brand new AP24 uh, that completes sort of our Wi-Fi 6C portfolio uh, for the indoor portfolio awesomeness. AI-driven RRM takes a whole another leap for us today uh, with uh, with site behavior learning and and last but not least uh, AP auto placement. Others have announced we have delivered, so please uh, try them in your own networks. Uh, uh, we 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 are uh, super excited about it.